BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Nerd 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. Just a couple quick things before we truly begin. The first is that I would like to remind you guys that you can always download the show for free at Launchpad 1, and there is a very particular episode that is exclusively available on Launchpad 1. Launchpad 1 contains the pure podcast version, like just the audio, the thing you can download, take it on the go, anywhere and anyhow. And I recorded an initial Zodiac Mondays, and I just didn't completely like the result. And I was debating on doing uh, this topic that you see here, the myths about the Zodiac Killer, or doing something completely different, responding to uh, some different people in some unusual ways. And I decided not to put it out on YouTube, but there's an episode exclusively available on Launchpad 1. There's a link to that in the description box. You can find it if you go to the website under Black Box Online Radio under the same name, but the easiest way to navigate is through the description box there um, and just click on the link. In addition to just listening, another great way to support the channel is by visiting Amazon.com and having a look at the book Killer on a White Horse by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel murder mystery, and of course there is the Teespring page. Lots of merchandise available, and remember, being weird is not a crime. The next announcement is a big thank you to everyone who checked out the Sleep podcast over the weekend. Yes, I decided to make that one because some people were saying that they use black box online radio to fall asleep so i thought why not make a customized version of that and no it's not like those asmrs that are done in the whisper voices but it's intended to be something that would help people fall asleep it's still up on the channel and there was not a debunking video that came out this weekend on the weekends i had been doing a debunking series talking about the zodiac killer suspects that i think are absolutely not the Zodiac, but I did not make one this weekend because I appeared on the Planet X Filmworks channel, so lots of things to visit, lots of things to uh, have a listen to, and if you're somebody who can't simply hear enough about the Zodiac Killer, I am also the host of the segment on the Zodiac Killer channel called Interviews with the Experts, and last weekend I interviewed Mike Rodelli, the author of the Hunt for Zodiac, and In the Shadow of Mount Diablo. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of a preview, because after our interview was done, I had several emails that came in from Mike Rodelli when he just wanted to share some additional notes that he felt were left out from that interview discussion. And I hope you guys will listen to it once again on the Zodiac Killer channel interview with the experts. Mike Rodelli is a real groundbreaking researcher because not only was he someone who was who has been at this for decades, but also he has been very influential in getting pieces of the case file released to the general public. Mike Rodelli is the guy who thinks that Shel Cavale was the Zodiac killer. Shel Cavale was a Norwegian American businessman, very wealthy citizen actually the premier importer of Volkswagens on the West Coast. There's so many differences about Shel Cavale um, compared to many of the other Zodiac Killer suspects. I mean, for starters, those things, he was a millionaire. Some of the Zodiac Killer suspects lived in abject poverty until their deaths. And also, with Cavale, he was much older than many other suspects. He was born in 1919, so he would have been around 4950 at the time of the murders going on in 68 and 69, but Mike Rodelli has provided explanations about how all of that could tie into his theory in our interview, but right now I would like to read this segment that he has written out here, and that says, I happen to think that 
There are breadcrumbs of evidence that Cavale has strewn in our path over the years, even though they're open to interpretation, and I stand behind the interpretations I made because I know how both of them evolved, and both of them were derived in such a way that I didn't know what I was going to end up with when I started out. I didn't start out with either solution that I ended up with. They just happened to evolve through deduction the way they did. And he also says that he has something to uh, share about the bus bomb letter and how that could tie into Cavale. Perhaps we can do something with Mike in the future on that one. But he has another message here. One last point. This is, I'm actually going to be talking about comparing Mike Rodelli's book to Robert Graysmith's. In his original book, Robert Graysmith said that he wanted to present every scrap of evidence he could in order to help people solve the case. I would consider the Stein eyewitness and the Officer Falk sighting to be the key cornerstone eyewitnesses in the case. I already told you that Graysmith never attempted to speak to Lindsay Robbins or any of the kids, those are the witnesses, about their sketches. But what I forgot to tell you is that when we spoke to Don Falk and about 2006, he said that Robert Graysmith didn't speak to him either. In fact, he said that he had contacted Graysmith and asked him why he didn't interview him, and Graysmith said, well, I'm writing a second book and I'll interview you for that book. Then Falk was left scratching his head when the second book came out and Graysmith didn't interview him for that one either. At the time, and for many years, until he cleared the air, it was widely believed that he and Zelms had contributed to the sketch. So here, you had a police sketch that was made by the Stein eyewitnesses and Falk that looked nothing like Arthur Lee Allen, and Graysmith avoided speaking to either of them. I think that you can draw your own conclusion as to why he did that. So big thank you to Mike Rodelli for coming on the Zodiac Killer channel, and Every week there's going to be a new series, um, new episode in the series, Interviews with the Experts, hosted by me, Ned Dahan, and that is uh, purely their channel. Jack Cooper and Steve Beaumont run that one. I am just the host. They are making all the decisions in regards to the guest list. Like some people were sending some stuff into Black Box Online Radio. Hey, it would be nice if you had this guest on there. Hey, that is up to them. I will talk to uh, almost, I repeat, almost anyone on that um segment because I think that it was very beneficial to do the ones we've done so far, talking to Mike Rodelli, Mike Morford, Thomas Henry Horan. But if you um do have any requested guests, you can go over to the Zodiac Killer channel and put your ideas down in the comments section below. And I think all their contact information, like the YouTube channel, is on the YouTube channel, like the emails and the social media. And you can navigate from there. But yeah, it's, it's been a good series uh, so far, and I was really glad that Mike Rodelli wanted to do the interview, and he has shared a lot of stuff about his suspect, Shel Cavale. Now, moving from Mike Rodelli to a different Mike, we are going to be talking about the Zodiac Killer myths. And this is an article that was published on Zodiac Killer Facts, talking about Mike Butterfield now, ZodiacKillerFacts.com. There was an article that was put out on his website that identified these 10 myths of the Zodiac Killer. And I have wanted to do this for some time, and I have been debating it. There were some other topics that came up, but I wanted to do that other one. I just really didn't like the result of it, so I'm putting it out only on the, um, the Launchpad one page. But let's look at... Mike Butterfield's 10 Myths About the Zodiac Killer. I'll say what I agree with, what I don't agree with, the points to challenge, points that um, seem fine as they are. Myth number 10. The Zodiac was an expert marksman. The popular portrait of the Zodiac depicts the killer as an expert marksman. Books, television shows, and websites often cite the killer's shooting skills as evidence that he received some military training with weapons. Author Robert Graysmith wrote in his 1986 book that the first Zodiac crime at Lake Herman Road was an incredible example of marksmanship. And at Lake Herman Road, um, just to throw in an interjection, this is where the Zodiac killer talked about taping the pencil flashlight to the gun, and then that creates the cone of light, and if you aim at the exact center, then you will hit the target. Butterfield continues, the Zodiac shot five times in three different attacks. In the first shooting, the killer shot one victim in the head point-blank range. 
Another victim was shot five times as she was trying to run away. In the second attack, the killer opened fire on a parked car and at the victim's inside. In the third shooting, the killer shot the victim in the head at point-blank range. These shootings did not demonstrate any particular skill with weapons beyond the ability to point the gun and pull the trigger. I agree with Michael Butterfield on this one, with the exception of what Graysmith was talking about at Lake Herman Road. And he's talking about shooting Betty Lou Jensen as she's running away from the perpetrator. Um, that one is a little bit different because, as he says, David Faraday at Lake Herman Road, the first um, crime and Zodiac acts activity, was shot at point-blank rage. Mike Majot was more or less sprayed with bullets, as well as Darlene Fair and the two people sitting in the car at Blue Rock Springs. At the Stein murder, also shot with point-blank range. I completely agree. That doesn't display any true amount of marksmanship. Shooting Betty Lou Jensen, I'm kind of undecided about that. Because, well, first, Les Lundblad said very clearly that um, her body would have been silhouetted against the night sky, so the killer would have been able to see her um, silhouette more or less and would have been able to shoot her all the same. But I've had some conflicting narratives because I'm not very... um up to date with guns, even though I am a West Virginian, I don't do a whole lot of shooting. So some people say that it's absolutely false about taping a pencil flashlight to a twenty two caliber firearm and shooting in the center of the light cone. And someone else has written into the channel saying, yes, I'm a hunter. I've done that before when I've been out raccoon hunting. That's a normal thing that people do. So I'm, I'm a little bit um, on the fence with that one. Myth number nine, the Zodiac crime scenes form a giant radian angle. In June 1970, a Zodiac letter included a code which was accompanied by a map of the Bay Area with a cross circle drawn over Mount Diablo. In another letter, the Zodiac wrote, The Mount Diablo code concerns radians and inches along the radians. In 1980, amateur sleuth Gareth Penn claimed that the Zodiac crime scenes formed a giant radian angle on the surface of the Earth. By a Radian, he means an angle of 57.3 degrees, sometimes written as 57.296. But um, Michael Butterfield has been one of the largest critics of Gareth Penn's radian theory, and I've uh, mentioned him in uh, some other episodes that I've done on Gareth Penn. I'll continue. Gareth Penn's locations, measurements, and conclusions were incorrect and the crime scenes did not form a radian, but his radian claim was repeated in popular crime books by author Colin Wilson and endorsed by many others, including this author. That's kind of weird. It says, C. Michael Butterfield. Hmm. I don't know what he means by that, because he's, um, he has some link there. Other amateur sleuths later adapted the radian myth to suit their own theories. In his book Most Evil, Steve Hodell used the radian theory to support his claim that his father was responsible for the Zodiac murders as well as the Black Dahlia murder and many unsolved crimes. Dennis Kaufman also used the Radian myth to accuse his stepfather. His stepfather would be Jack Torrance, if I remember correctly. And another amateur sleuth later claimed that Gareth Penn was responsible for the Zodiac crimes. I think we know who he is. According to Gareth Penn's theory, the peak of Mount Diablo, the crime scene in San Francisco, and the crime scene in Vallejo all formed an angle between 57 and 58 degrees, but the correct measurement proves that the angle formed by these locations is at least 60 degrees. The Zodiac's map and radian clues may contain a geometric construction and using geographic locations on a map, but the facts debunk Gareth Penn's radian theory. I was talking about this with Mike Rodelli in our interview and asking him, what did he think about Gareth Penn? Not asking about Michael Butterfield at all, but I was asking Mike Rodelli, what do you think about Gareth Penn and this radian theory? And he says that, um, I mean, if the angles are not completely matching up, I mean, the person is going to try and attack victims in areas that are going to be close by. So firstly, you would expect that there would be some type of leeway. I mean, how on earth would he the Zodiac get people to park their car at exactly the, the parking lot that is going to match up to 57.29 degrees. I mean, if it's 60 degrees, it's only off by two and a half degrees leeway. And I think 
the, I think the people who believe in Gareth Penn's radiant theory to this day just simply say that, okay, this angle goes to Blue Rock Springs Golf Course, not Blue Rock Springs Park. Well, the perpetrator was trying to murder people, and they just kind of accepted that it was off by two and a half degrees. Um, I don't think the killer's feelings were hurt, if that indeed were true. But um, Mike Rodelli actually shared something that he found a different radiant angle that does seem to match up much more closely, and it, it would it would have actually been the first radiant if the Zodiac uh, did indeed do that. So you can hear more about that in my interview with him. Myth number eight, the Zodiac crimes were done by copycat killers or were a hoax. In the Annals of Unsolved Crime, famed JFK assassination researcher Edward Epstein wrote that the lack of any matching evidence in the Zodiac crime scenes or letters proves that one person could not have been responsible for all four Zodiac crimes in Zodiac letters. According to Epstein, Zodiac suspect Arthur Lee Allen could have been responsible for the first two attacks, but a copycat, or copycats plural, were responsible for the Lake Perriessa stabbing and the murder of Paul Stein, the taxi driver. Epstein further stated that one person or persons had committed the Zodiac crimes, while a different person wrote the letters. Hmm, interesting theory. Where have I heard this before? Epstein's theory worked backward from the preconceived notion that Lee Allen must have been the Zodiac, and then discarded and dismissed evidence which conflicted with his assumptions. Epstein's certainty of Allen's guilt appeared to be based on eyewitness identification of the suspect. Um, I just want to share, though, I don't know if it was this guy, Edward J. Epstein or not, or I have no, I, I don't really know too much about him. It says he's more of a Kennedy assassination buff and researcher, but somebody wrote into the channel once giving that exact theory, not exactly the Zodiac hoax theory. They said that, um, that's just their theory that, um, Yes, there were multiple killers, that there were people who committed these crimes, and they were united by pieces of writing, and it's all a hoax. Thomas Henry Horan was completely right, the author of The Myth of the Zodiac Killer, the Great Zodiac Killer Hoax series. He was right about everything, except he left out that Arthur Lee Allen was involved in all of it. So it sounds like the uh, whoever wrote that uh, comment in was um, more inspired by this Edward Epstein theory. Um, the, uh, you know, I don't know if we have enough to say that this is, um, something that's been completely ruled out, and I don't, uh, think that that is, we can actually put that into a, uh, myth category. The myth of the Zodiac Killer is not a myth in itself, because this is an unsolved case. To say that the crimes were committed by copycats is completely off the table, Meaning that the first two uh, murders took place, Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs, really those three people that would have been murdered, and then you have a different perpetrator at Lake Berryessa and a different perpetrator at the Stein murder. Well, I don't believe we have certainty that a single person did all that. I have talked a lot about the multiple killers theory, but I don't endorse it, or the hoax theory, or even a single killer theory. I think that... um. It's an unsolved case for a reason. We do not know who committed those crimes. And it's, it's a bit of a premature statement. But uh, what do you think about the the multiple killers theory? And I tried to get into a little bit of that with Mike Rodelli. Because there's a theory out there that involves his suspect that I didn't talk too much about. It's called the Four Horsemen Theory. Mike Rodelli's suspect is Shel Cavale, as I said, the Norwegian-American businessman. He worked in the auto trade, but he was also connected to something called the Four Horsemen Theory, that just that, there were four different killers. And that's not exactly a copycat or a hoax crime. Instead, that's more of a thrill-kill club that each person commits a murder. And when I first truly, truly began looking into the Zodiac killer crimes, which was about two years after I started putting out episodes on YouTube, then I truly began learning about the stuff, not just running my mouth. I was so curious about that. That was like my initial gut reaction, and that it was indeed a thrill kill club because of all these differences, and it almost looked like you were dealing with the psychology of multiple people, but I always stood by the claim that one person could have done this. And of course, the authorities are going to know more than I do. 
the authorities are going to know more than the general public does. Maybe they have some DNA evidence that they're, they're keeping under lock and key, or they have forensic information that is not revealed to the general public. But um, Michael Butterfield has been very critical of the hoax theory, and he has, um, well, I, he wrote an eight-part article series, which I talked about in the episodes, Zodiac Killer Hoax Theory Open Discussion. It's a five-part series, and if you go to the playlist on that one here on Black Box Online Radio, it will feed right into the book discussion on the myth of the Zodiac Killer, and you can hear all about the Zodiac hoax theory. And these are two different things, mind you. When most people talk about the copycat crime, they mean Lake Berryessa. They mean somebody is wearing a costume, stabbing people during the daylight, and using a knife instead of a gun. The only time the Zodiac Killer wore that hooded costume was at Lake Berryessa, September 27th, 1969. But let's go to number seven on the list. The Manson family were linked to the Zodiac crimes, myth number seven. Charles Manson and his family of killers became famous after a brutal series of murders in Southern California. Some of the members had left messages written in blood at the crime scene. Charles Manson and other family members spent time in the San Francisco Bay Area, leading some to speculate that Manson and the Zodiac murders were somehow connected. Conspiracy radio host Mae Russell speculated that the Manson murders were part of a government plot involving brainwashing satanic cults in the CIA. Mae Russell, the, the same group of people, were committing the sinister operations known as the Son of Sam shootings in New York and the Zodiac killings in California. Now, whether that's true or not, I've said this once on the channel, I'll say it again, I give credit to Mae Brussel for being ahead of her time because the stuff that Tom O'Neill revealed in his book Chaos that came out just a couple of years ago, Mae Brussel was talking about that in the 1970s. You just heard Satanic Cults Brainwashing and the CIA chaos by Tom O'Neill, some very similar things. And Mae Brussel even talks about how Charles Manson could have been an informant, which Tom O'Neill explores in his book. And also, about the Zodiac-Manson connection, I believe that Mae Brussel zoned in more on Robert Linkletter as a Zodiac killer suspect, and I'm really tempted to investigate more into the death of Diane Linkletter, because there are a huge range of theories about what happened to her. The most basic version of the suicide of Diane Linkletter is that she was a troubled 20-year-old individual, and she jumped out of a window and committed suicide, or she was killed by the Zodiac Killer. And I'm back on to one of those. If there were an eighth day in the week, maybe I would do an episode, like a deep dive segment on that one. But realistically, maybe I'll just read the book about her, A Princess Wrongfully Accused. And I was thinking about polling you guys in the future about what kind of crimes you would like to hear about. And we could even do something for the Zodiac Monday segment, some more extensive stuff on Robert Linkletter as a Zodiac killer suspect. Robert Linkletter, of course, um, was the guy who invented the locking cap on pill bottles, made a ton of money for it, died in a car accident in the early 1980s. But um, there are also some things here on the Zodiac Manson page. Um, I, sh I should say the Zodiac Manson section at ZodiacularFacts.com. Zodiac Manson conspiracy theorist Howard Davis claims that his brother, and that the brother, excuse me, claims that the brother, not his brother, claims that the brother of a Manson victim had hired a private investigator who uncovered evidence that the Manson family was responsible for the Zodiac crimes. Davis also claimed that a pristine source in the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office revealed that the original investigation into the Manson murders had uncovered evidence linking Charles Manson to the Zodiac, including the hooded costume worn by the Zodiac during the stabbing at Lake Berryessa. According to Davis, his source also stated that the authorities in Southern California conspired to conceal this important evidence. And um, if I recall, the reason why the evidence was concealed in Howard Davis's theory is because they already had an amazingly expensive trial with the Manson family. And they're like, if we're going to have to put somebody on trial for the Zodiac killer crimes, this person being Howard's suspect, Bruce Davis, no relation, then it's going to cost at least $2 million. He's already going to jail for life, or I believe it was death at the time. We're not doing it again. We're just going to say that the case is unsolved and 
they just simply did not want to do it. Now, the alleged Zodiac Manson suspect, Bruce Davis, was convicted for the murders of Gary Hinman and Shorty Shea. Howard Davis claimed that those behind the cover-up feared that another trial would somehow jeopardize the previous convictions. A Zodiac prosecution would so would not somehow undo Bruce Davis's murder convictions. Right, and that point, um, I think I... I, I think the bigger point was the cost, as I said. I don't see Butterfield talking about that here, but I, I believe that it was um, the the uh, cost of the trial was a big factor. They didn't want to spend the millions of dollars on that when he's already going to jail for at least life, and Bruce Davis is still in jail for life, so I'm not sure I agree with that point. The pristine source that Howard Davis was talking about inside the L.A. District Attorney's Office was identified, and he denied that he had ever made such statements to Howard Davis, he dismissed the conspiracy tale as, I can't believe that whoever suggested it has any credibility whatsoever. He further described Davis as a nut job. All right, now let's just look here. Are you guys following this discussion? I hope you're following this because what did we just hear? All right, somebody has a pristine source who has told them something. This unidentified pristine source has been investigated, and it turned out he didn't say what someone else said that he said. Are you following that? I'm just hearing a game of he said, she said, except we don't know who the he or the she is. Oh yeah, well I talked to uh, person X and they told me that um, somebody was guilty. Oh yeah, no, no, that's not true. I also talked to person X and they said that um, they didn't say anything to you. They said that that never happened. What are we supposed to do to people like who are trying to receive the communication? It's like um, talking to a friend who's telling you a story about someone who you're not familiar with, and you're like, I have no idea who any of these people are, just kind of like that. Uh, myth number six. Now, this is intense. The Zodiac killed dozens of victims. I also do not believe the Zodiac killed dozens of victims. So far, so good in agreement with this one. In his letters and telephone calls, the Zodiac claimed credit for six specific crimes and mentioned one other attack, but did not identify the victim. During the phone call to Vallejo police after the Blue Rock Springs shooting, the caller claimed that he was responsible for the attack and also killed some kids last year on an apparent reference to the murders at Lake Herman Road. In his first two letters, the Zodiac described the shootings at Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs. At the scene of the stabbing at Lake Perriessa, the Zodiac left a handwritten message on the car door, which included the dates of the two shootings and the stabbing. The Zodiac then killed Paul Stein in the North Bay area, and so excuse me, killed Paul Stein and claimed that he had killed two people in the North Bay area, an apparent reference to the previous attacks. And I've always said that, um, okay, not always, I have recently said that I thought that the Zodiac wrote the message on the car door at Lake Berryessa in substitution of a letter. But um, I mostly agree with this one with Mike Butterfield. I do not endorse any of the unconfirmed crimes. I simply think there is insufficient evidence to link anybody else's murder to the Zodiac Killer other than the canonical crimes. Myth number five, the Zodiac took credit for crimes that he didn't commit. Well, this should be good. The Zodiac's habit of including a box score at the end of some of the letters was understandably interpreted by many observers as a, a victim count. Yeah, but not by me. I've never once thought 100% that that's what the Zodiac was talking about, a victim count. I mean, it even goes up to 100 in some of the unconfirmed communications. Media reporters repeatedly linked to the Zodiac linked the Zodiac to many unsolved crimes, despite the fact that the evidence did not establish any connection. The Zodiac did not deny or confirm his involvement in other crimes, despite ongoing reports suggesting that he was responsible. The Zodiac demonstrates that he only took credit for six specific crimes, Lake Herman Road, Blue Rock Springs, the Lake Berryessa stabbing, the murder of Paul Stein in San Francisco, and the Sherry Jo Bates murder in Riverside, as well as the Kathleen Johns abduction in 1970. The evidence indicates that the Zodiac remains the most logical suspect in all six crimes, did the Zodiac actually take credit for the murder of Sherry Jo Bates? I mean, I thought the Zodiac only said, you're learning about my Riverside work, but there are they're only getting the easy ones. There are a hell of a lot more down there, and that's the connection to Riverside. If, um, 
is Michael Butterfield and ZodiacKillerFacts.com are thinking that the letters Bates had to die, there will be more signed with a Z or genuine Zodiac communications. Well, they most likely are not. 99.999 repeating are not. And the typed Riverside Confession, well, here's the problem with that. Number one, the Zodiac was not a fan of typing his letters. Number two, Sherry Jo Bates is addressed by name in the letter where the Zodiac did not do that. He would more say the boy, the girl, the kids, not addressing her by name. And you'd have to expect that, well, there just is, um, there's just so many differences with the Bates crime. I absolutely do not believe Sherry Jo Bates was a genuine Zodiac killer victim, so I would also dispute that. All of these suspected Zodiac crimes remain unsolved. Mostly, yeah, mostly. And the identity of the real killer remains unknown. The evidence indicates the Zodiac remains the most logical suspect in these cases. Here is a big problem I have with Michael Butterfield's writing. He does this all the time. I pointed this out many times during that Zodiac Killer hoax um, essay that he wrote. He says somebody else is wrong. Then he provides a reason. Then he says, okay, this is what is actually true. But he does not provide a reason for that. All of the suspected Zodiac crimes remain unsolved, and the identity of the real killer remains unknown. The evidence that the Zodiac remains the most logical suspect in these cases. Okay, so the unsolved crimes, um, the, all, all the suspected Zodiac crimes remain unsolved. That's a fact. The identity of the real killer remains unknown. Okay, I understand you. The evidence indicates that the Zodiac remains the most logical suspect in these cases does not provide a supporting point for that. Myth number four. The police were about to arrest a major suspect, but he died. I think we know who he is. His name is... I'll, I'll let you take a guess. No, no, um, it was Arthur Lee Allen. In 1994, the San Francisco Chronicle published a story written by Ryder McDowell suggesting that the police officer and Harvey Hines and his suspect, Lawrence Kane, were coming into play. Vallejo Police Captain Roy Conway dismissed the suspect, saying, I believe that the Zodiac was Arthur Lee Allen. If I could show Harvey Hines what evidence we have on Allen today, he would get off this kick immediately. Unfortunately, I can't do that for legal reasons. He further claimed if Allen were alive today, he would file charges against him as the Zodiac. Unfortunately, they ran out of time making the case, and Allen died. Retired Department of Justice agent Fred Shira Sogo disagreed. Arthur Lee Allen is not the Zodiac. If Conway had evidence proving Allen was the Zodiac, he should have shown it to the Department of Justice. Yeah, absolutely. Double absolutely. At the time of Allen's death in Vallejo, the police department had not produced any credible evidence to implicate Allen in the Zodiac crimes. Allen's estranged friend claimed that Allen had once confessed his desire to commit murders. Allen's a strange friend. I wonder who that is. Could that possibly be Donald Lee Cheney? And um, Don Cheney just lost all credibility by saying some things this way, some things that way. Like he's saying that um, Arthur Lee Allen uh, walked him through Blue Rock Springs Park and showed him things where he was thinking about murders. But then I guess, I guess it would have been... Uh, Five, six years earlier, he said he had never heard of Blue Rock Springs Park. I don't think that, um, if that is John Don Cheney that he's talking about, no, he loses all credibility. Myth number three, the Zodiac called in to a TV show with attorney Melvin Belli. Well, uh, we should look no further than the 340 cipher. That wasn't me on the TV, which brings up an interesting point about me. I am not afraid of the gas chamber. Myth number two, the Zodiac investigators did not cooperate. Ah, you should watch what you're saying. You might endorse the hoax theory, Butterfield. During a 2000 appear 2007 appearance on the television show America's Most Wanted, Robert Graysmith told the host John Walsh, I really want this guy caught. He was giving us so much information. The clues were tantalizing. I realized the, part the departments in the different counties were not sharing. Graysmith and other amateur sleuths often claimed that jurisdictional conflict somehow hindered the investigation and permitted the killer to escape justice. In the film, 
Zodiac, Graceman's character, played by Jake Gyllenhaal, is given brief access to the Vallejo police reports. Police reports, FBI files, and other documents produced during the decades of investigation reveal that virtually all of the various agencies involved had access to virtually all of the available information regarding the Zodiac crimes attributed to the Zodiac investigations conducted by the police departments of Venecia, Vallejo, Napa County, San Francisco, and the California State Department of Justice. As I said, watch what you're saying. You might endorse the hoax theory and not realize it, that somebody was reading the police reports and taking credit for crimes that he didn't commit using info in those reports. Remember, I will state some facts that only I and the police know. And myth number one, the Zodiac knew and stalked his victims. On the night of July 4th, 1969, Darlene Farron and Mike Michaud were sitting in a parked car at Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo. Another vehicle arrived, and a man shined a bright light into Darlene's car. Mike and Darlene speculated that the man was a police officer until he opened fire with a gun. Mike and Darlene were shot several times before the man finally left the scene. Police investigated the possibility that Darlene was killed by someone she knew, including her ex-husband, which would be Jim Phillips Crabtree, and others. Okay, now taking a step back from the hoax theory, because Jim Phillips Crabtree has been one of the prime suspects for the um, Blue Rock Springs shooting and Thomas Henry Horan's Great Zodiac Killer hoax uh, setup. So, um, the some people noted that one man named George had been harassing Darlene at her place of work. Police investigated, and the man's wife claimed that she was with George at the times of the shooting. No other potential stalkers were identified during the investigation. And this guy named George is George Waters. Many times on the channel, I stated that he was a Filipino-American, but when I was reading Zodiac Killer, Just the Facts, by the Tom Voigt's, um compilation of the police reports, it says that he was born in the Philippines, but his race was listed as Caucasian. It seems, though, that this is the guy that was harassing Darlene Farron at the restaurant where she worked. Many people get accused of this. Lawrence Kane was identified by Darlene Farron's sister, Pam Huckabee, seems like total disinfo, and then other sleuths like Lyndon Lafferty tried to say that his suspect, George Russell Tucker, whose real name is William Joseph Grant, was a regular customer at Darlene Farron's restaurant, and he was the man who was harassing her, and even Robert Graysmith said that Arthur Lee Allen lived close by. Months after the murder, some members of Darlene's family met with celebrity psychic Joseph DeLuise. Darlene's mother told DeLuise that Darlene had made a cryptic remark just hours before she died, saying, you might read about me in the papers tomorrow. Darlene's mother had not mentioned this potentially important information during any of her conversations with police. Do you think it's because she was trying to set somebody up in a sting operation and she was a confidential informant and the sting operation backfired? They thought uh, the police uh, were in the area, so they opened fire? Or do you simply think that she went to the park to uh, buy some weed and pills and then somebody knew that people frequently went to the park, and then that person, the Zodiac, shot her. Which one is it? Darlene's sister claims that she had been part of a satanic cult. Darlene's sisters said a lot of things, and they had known this other Zodiac victims and had been stalked by a man who committed a previous murder. The sisters never mentioned this seemingly important information to investigators searching for Darlene's killer. Right. I mean, like, I'm absolutely skeptical of all of those things because you think that you think they would have just called that out more or that they would have uh, brought that to attention to someone if those things were actually real. But that brings us to the end of our discussion, all these 10 myths here. And thank you to Michael Butterfield for writing out this list, and I've been responding to it, and I hope that any challenges or disputes or criticisms are just meant to be honest discussions and responses, nothing nasty intended, and no ill feelings. And Michael Butterfield is always welcome to weigh in in the comments section below, and anybody can weigh in in the comments section below. If you think I'm wrong about everything, please tell me why. You can also write me at blackboxonlineradio at aol.com, or on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. There's always Instagram, BlackboxNet88 on Instagram. 
lots of ways to stay in touch, whatever's best for you. The best way, though, is that AOL email address in the description box, and you can always visit some of the other pages, Teespring, Amazon, uh, Launchpad One, but please feel free to share what you want in the comments section down below, and you can also, one more time, go over to the Zodiac Killer channel and have a listen to my interview with Mike Rodelli, also Planet X Filmworks had some stuff out about the Zodiac Killer, and please like and subscribe, it really helps out the channel, thank you so much one more time, and until next time.